Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Christmas Eve of 2019. It has been pointed out to me in the last few moments that it is warmer today than most of our recent Easter sunrise services. <laughs> we may be dreaming of a white Christmas, but Christ is born amongst us this day, and for that we celebrate. And I have just received the best gift of my Christmas because I get to stand here and look out on this beautiful congregation this evening. It is a joy to be with you. It is a blessing that we can be together and worship on this Christmas Eve. So I welcome you. I especially welcome guests, family, friends, extended family, travelers, someone who may have never been in a church before, and those of you who may have worshipped every Christmas Eve for as long as you can remember. God welcomes us all. In fact, that is the heart of this story. There is no place, not even a stable and a barnyard of animals, that cannot welcome the light of Christ. And that is what we celebrate this evening. Welcome and Merry Christmas to you all. Welcome tonight to a celebration like no other. The Holy Bird. Let the love of Jesus be born in your hearts and spirits. We open our hearts to receive this blessed gift. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. Christ our Savior is born, hallelujah. Rejoice, good friends, the good news is here. We come to sing and celebrate the coming of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. We invite you to stand as you are able. <coughs> people come to worship on this Christmas Eve, let us pray together. God with us, with joy and thanksgiving, we gather as your people. We have come to hear again the timeless story of Christ's birth. In the excitement of this night, quiet our hearts that we may know the peace and fullness of this holy time. Shine, O light, in the darkness of our world. Sing, O angels, in the stillness of our hearts. Glory to God in the highest, 
and on earth peace among those God favors. This we pray in the name of the child of Bethlehem. The fact that God is incarnate with us does not necessarily bring us immediate festive joy. Our world remains wounded, wars, selfishness, and bitterness linger. Our hearts also stay injured, pain persists. For a Christian, just as everyone else, there will be illness, senseless hurt, broken dreams, cold, and hunger. The incarnation does not promise heaven on earth. It promises heaven in heaven. Our earth, on earth, it promises us something else. God's presence in our lives. Tonight we can see a star shine and its splendor fills up the sky. It's the same that appeared on the wise men and the wise men revered when hope was born this night. Shine and its splendor fills up the sky. 
The joy of Christmas doesn't begin on this evening, and in the church it began weeks ago as we began observing the season of Advent on the first Sunday of December. And the children have helped us count down the weeks and days toward this evening, and so this evening I would like to invite them all to come forward, and they have to si uh, sit down in the front here. So all of the young people, would you come and join me this morning? Merry Christmas to you. It's wonderful to see you all. I'm going to have you sit in such a way that you're going to be able to see the screen. So if you want to sit in the floor and face this way, that would be wonderful. Because I'm going to show you a little something in a minute. Welcome, everybody. It is wonderful to see you. I'm so glad you're here with your families tonight that we could celebrate <laughs> Christmas. So a couple of weeks ago, some of you were in our Christmas pageant, and we told one of the stories of Christmas. Does anybody remember what the name of our pageant was called? The Friendly Beasts. Some of you were the Friendly Beasts. Remember that? Some of you were cows, and some of you were sheep, and some of you were shepherds, right? Wise men. Remember SpongeBob cow pants? Do you remember that? Is it all coming back to you now? Way to go. There you go. There you go. You had to be here, I'm sorry. <laughs> but tonight we have gathered and we hear the Christmas story told to us in a different way. And I'm going to invite us to watch this video. So you know how you were all in a Christmas program a couple of weeks ago and you acted out the part? Well, this is a Christmas program where the kids told the story and you know who acted it out? The adults. And it's a pretty funny result. Let's watch. Mary, she was doing laundry, and then the angel just appeared, and she was really scared. So Gabriel was like, Mary, you're going to have, what? I can't, I can't say a good name. Mary, you're going to have a baby. I, you're going to have a baby, and you will call him Jesus. And then Mary was like, I'm not going to have a baby yet. I'm only a teenager. I'm not married. Then the angel Gabriel told Joseph that Mary is not lying. She, you are having a new baby. And so they met up. They went to Bethlehem, which was Joseph's old town. They ride a donkey. <laughs> oh, a camel. Oh, yeah, a camel. She said, this donkey's fast. Well, they tried to go to a hotel, and they asked the keeper, um, for a place to stay, the keeper said, we have no rooms, literally no rooms. <laughs> so Mary and Joseph walked away sadly, but then he said, the only place in here in Bethlehem hand that, that you can stay, stay is a staple, and then he just pointed. 
pointed the way and they followed. When the shepherds were taking care of the sheep, and then they saw angels. The angel said, a new baby is getting born, who is king of the Jews. The angel was singing. And then the shepherd said, I think we should go there and meet him. Second, I think, said, yeah, I agree with you. And the other said, yeah, me too. They had to walk through a bunch of grass and bushes, maybe have to camp out at night. And then the wise men heard about it. And then a star appeared. Well, we should probably follow that star. It's pointing down to the barn. So maybe we should follow it. Maybe. So the wise men went to Jesus. They gave them gifts. A stuffed animal, like a hippo one, to have at home. Some diapers, and some wipes, and some milk, and some shoes, some Jordan. Gold, ring, and platinum. And I don't know how I would survive in that barn. Too stinky, too crowded, and ugh. I think he probably pooped. <laughs> Because the room is very smelly. Thank you for coming. He's adorable. He's going to be our best friend. I love you, and you're the best baby i ever seen. There, I said it. <laughs> the new baby is going to change the world. And that baby's going to change the world. That's right. How long do you think it would take for your parents to practice that Christmas pageant? Do you think if we started now, they could be ready by next Christmas? No, no yes. you don't think so? No. All right. Addison and Autumn are going to help us light the Advent candle wreath, and tonight you get to light the Christ candle. We light a candle. It seems a simple thing, lighting a candle, a quiet thing, to provide something bright in the midst of darkness. But does it make the world a better place? Lighting a candle. We light two candles and three then four because we have made, we have seen a light and we believe increasing the light does make a difference in the world around us. We light these candles because we want to be a people of light who know God is love the world so much. This God chooses to be born on a, in a manger in the midst of darkness. We light these candles as a sign of the light of the world that is coming to our darkness, and we sing with joy as we light four candles of Advent. The circle is almost complete. We light the Christ candle, the light of love, as the sign of Christ's presence among us, no matter how dark it may seem. The people who have walked in the darkness have seen a great light, God to the glory in the highest heavens, and let earth on, and on earth, let there be love. Thank you very much, Addison and Autumn, and thank you all. We wish you and your families a very Merry Christmas. Thank you for being here this evening. You can go back and sit wherever you came, and I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. <laughs>
Let us listen for the word of God from the Gospel of Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been, had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just as when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. May God add blessing to the hearing of this holy word this evening. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of our readers this evening. Felicia and Addison, and Betty and Autumn and Ellie, and uh, to thank all of our musicians, including Julie and Kathy and Brian, not just for this evening, but for what they have done throughout the season and the year. And thank you to Sarah for being with us and gracing us with that duet with Julie. We are indeed, indeed blessed. So the Christmas story from which we just heard from the Gospel of Matthew that Felicia just shared with us is one of two places in the Bible where we hear the story of the birth of Jesus. The other comes from the Gospel of Luke, and perhaps it is the more well-known of the two, and you re might remember the story because we hear it every year on Christmas Eve. Uh, that story begins with the decree going out from Emperor Augustus that all the word sh world should be registered. It was, a, it was a census, and so all went to their towns to be registered, including Joseph going from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, which was the city of David called Bethlehem. And he went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child so since that original time, just think, Christmas Eve is still one of the busiest travel days of the year. <laughs> Except that just as happens in the Bible, there is always some kind of obstacle standing in the way of a trouble-free trip. Have you ever noticed that when you yourself have gone on a vacation or a journey? It seems like something <laughs> always happens. Take this morning, for example. Now, it's estimated that 47.5 million people travel by air during this holiday season between Christmas and New Year's. Hundreds of thousands of them today, most certainly on Christmas Eve. But with dense fog this morning, limiting visibility in Chicago to less than a quarter of a mile, maybe you, you heard about this, hundreds of thousands of, well, hundreds of flights and thousands of people were grounded for hours at Chicago's O'Hare and Midway airports. Was anybody stuck in that today? No. Thanks be to God. <laughs> and I can only imagine what the scene in the airport, right? I mean, we've probably been there at one point or another with all of those anxious travelers, and they were just trying to get home for Christmas, and it's the morning of Christmas Eve, and the flights are delayed and canceled. I read about two of those travelers. They were sisters. Ashley was 30 and Morgan is 23, and they were traveling with a 17-month-old child they traveled overnight from Honolulu to get to Chicago for a connecting flight to go home to Dayton, Ohio, only to show up at Chicago at 8.30 this morning and find out that their flight had been canceled. Now, I don't know what it was like for Joseph and Mary to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem, but I have to think traveling from Honolulu to Dayton, Ohio through Chicago and getting there and finding out that your flight is canceled with a toddler on board is not exactly your idea of a splendid trip. Although I'm sure it will be memorable. It will be one that they tell that child as they get older. It is sometimes difficult to connect the stories of Jesus' birth and life with our own world, isn't it? I mean, we fly. Joseph and Mary traveled on the back of a donkey. We can travel around the world for the cost of airfare, 
While most of Jesus' life was lived within a 200-mile radius, most of which he and the disciples walked. Our inconveniences include fog and maybe snow or a flat tire. Joseph and Mary's travel obstacles included signs that said, there's no room for you and eventually rejection. And yet, technology aside, maybe our world isn't that different. Maybe Jesus was born into a world not entirely unlike ours. So what if Joseph and Mary were traveling on this day? Well, they probably couldn't have afforded to fly. So maybe this would have been the scene. I'm going to see, I, I hope you can see, I'm going, to, I'm going to have you take a close look as much as you can. Just take a minute looking at that. Uh, this is a drawing uh, called Jose y Maria by Everett Patterson. So if, if you look closely enough, you see some clever references. Do you notice some of those? The, the no vacancy sign, of course. Wiseman cigarettes, wise man cigarettes, you know that. The sign that's supposed to say new manager is missing the A, so it says new main. Sure. Dave's City Mo Motel. It's the city of David, Bethlehem. Dave's city. There's Mary riding not on the back of a donkey, but on a out of order 25 cent pony ride with Jose on the phone. Father James Martin looks at this picture and he says, you know, the more, the more you look at this contemporary portrait of Mary and Joseph, the more you, you get this clear-eyed portrayal of what families still endure today. The look in their eyes should be familiar to anyone who has met people who are poor and struggling. Mary and Joseph, the Gospels make clear, were not people of prominence except in God's eyes. They were both living in backwater towns of roughly two to 400 people. In fact, Nazareth was a town that had such a bad reputation that the Bible says quite literally, can anything good possibly come out of Nazareth? Mary and Joseph were marginal people from a marginal town in Roman-occupied Palestine, poor people living under the thumb of a powerful foreign power. So Mary and Joseph don't look quite as regal as they do in our nativity scene. They probably looked more like this. They were considered disposable. Nothing special, certainly no one to pay attention to, far less to care about. And as Luke's gospel recounts it, the two of them couldn't even find room. And so they had to seek lodgings among the animals. Marginal people finding a marginal place. So we hear this story every Christmas Eve, but we are invited to hear it not as a story about those people a long time ago. That's just history. The Christmas story is actually a story of good news for you and I. You know why? Because if Jesus could be born to an unnoticed couple living on the margins of the world, then there is no place that we can think of that is outside of God's presence. You can never fall too low in your life with God being unable to reach down and pick you up. There is no room dark enough where God cannot shine a light to show you the way out of the darkness. There is no such thing as having to be rich enough or privileged enough, or smart enough, or talented enough, or lucky enough to earn God's favor. I think that's good news. Of course, the irony is that Christmas is one of those times of year when we feel as if we need to be perfect. Many of you have Christmas traditions, I'm sure. What are some of the traditions that are your favorite Christmas traditions? Shout some of them out. What's, what's a tradition in your family? Make 
Making cookies. There's a Christmas tradition. What else? <coughs> Decorating. Uh, uh, who decorated like three minutes after Thanksgiving was over? There we go. There we go. Who decorated this morning? <laughs> Somewhere in between. What are some of your other traditions? Are there, are there other, other places you go every year, things you do? Family gatherings. Family gatherings, right? Maybe a concert. We used to go to the St. Olaf Christmas Festival every year when we lived up, up, up north. Um, we all have things that, w that we do, in, in, and we tend to find, especially at Christmas, that traditions are really important. Uh, for my wife, Anne, and our kids, our kids are all grown now. We have two grandchildren. One of the traditions in Anne's family has always been making Christmas cookies. And so for the last several years, we find a Saturday in, in uh, December, and we all gather, and it's been at our house. Well, this year, one Saturday turned into another, and we got to this last weekend, and we still hadn't done it. And, and plus, that our daughter, Laura, got married this summer, and she and her husband bought a house in late summer. So she's been saying since, since Halloween that she wanted to host the Christmas decorating and baking this year. So we said, that, that's fine. So, so, but the, the only day we could figure out to do it was this Sunday. Well, sure enough, Sunday came, and uh, both of our son-in-laws are working. One of our other children was traveling on the way out of town. As it turned out, it ended up being Laura, her mother, Anne, and myself in her new house in Waukesha. But here's the thing. So Laura really wanted to impress us. Her, her first sort of hosting a, 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 an adult big person gathering for mom and dad. So she made this wonderful spread food. She says, uh, text me when you're 10 minutes out because I want to have everything ready. So we got there and she had plates of cheeses and meats and she baked brie and she had two kinds of baked bread and all sorts of chocolates and hot apple cider. It was wonderful. It was amazing. We got there at 2 o'clock. At 5.30, we were still sitting around the table talking and eating. We never baked the cookies. <laughs> there will be no Christmas cookies in the Scott household this year. Don't feel sorry for us, please. We have received plenty between our two congregations. We will not go hungry. <coughs> so depending on how you look at it, it was either the end of one tradition or it was the beginning of a new one. So the question is, which do we choose to hang on to? The disappointment of things not going the way we wished they always have gone or embracing the joy of a new experience. See, God gives us a pretty wide margin of experiencing joy. Because if you can find joy in the Holy Family trotting through dusty roads so that the Savior of the world can be born amongst animals in Bethlehem, then I'm pretty sure you can find joy in a Christmas gathering under your own roof where things don't go exactly according to script. I, I love this saying. Jesus didn't say, come to all of you who are crushing it, living your best life, and I'll give you rest. No, he said, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Are any of you tonight weary or discouraged or tired? Well, if you haven't been, <laughs> there's a volunteer there. <laughs> if you're not now, you will be by tomorrow night, right? <coughs> well, don't worry. Because that's exactly how Jesus expects us to come to him. And on Christmas, that's exactly how Jesus comes to us. So if you're here tonight, you're not stuck in an airport, obviously. You're not waiting for a connecting flight to Dayton, Ohio. Presumably, you're where you need to be tonight. You're in Milton, Wisconsin. Maybe all of your Christmas preparations are done. Or maybe there's still a ham to put in the oven or cookies to bake and maybe a gift or two to wrap. Perhaps. Perhaps. But you know what? Even as we sit here on this Christmas Eve, it is not too late for me to ask you the question, what do you want for Christmas this year? And I, if somebody here wants to answer the question, what do you want for Christmas this year? 
a Fitbit. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> that sounds like a device that's just tricking me into like running. <laughs> if you ask my wife, Ann, which our children do every year, what do you want for Christmas year? Same thing every year. She said it for 25 years. What do you think she says? World peace. What do you want for Christmas, Mom? World peace. Now, it's a beautiful sentiment, right? It doesn't help our children who are frustrated because they never know what to get their mom for Christmas. It reminds me of this comic that was in this morning's paper. Um, I hope you can see it. I'll give you a second to read it. What do you hope for Christmas, Mom? Just for everyone to get along. In this house or the whole world? Well, it has to start somewhere. See, I'm glad you're here this evening. That we can be together on this Christmas Eve so that the peace of Christ can begin right here in this house. And if peace begins here as it did in Bethlehem, then it can spread. And it can spread to the margins, to the forgotten poor, and to the vilified immigrants and refugees, and to the lonely, and to the sick, and to the elderly, and to all the world. Because we wouldn't want to keep it to ourselves, would we? That's the joy of a gift. What do you want for Christmas this year? What do I want for Christmas? I want to kneel in Bethlehem, the air thick with alleluias, the angels singing that God is born among us in the light of the star. I want to see them come the wise ones and the humble. I want to see them come bearing whatever they treasure to lay at the feet of the one who gives them life. What do I want for Christmas? To see in that stable the whole world kneeling in thanks for a promise kept, new life. For in his nativity, we find ours. Thanks be to God. Amen. And amen. Stand as you're able. Let's sing together.
God's gift to us, among other things, is prayer. That we can have a connection with God whenever. Not just on Christmas Eve, not just when we're sitting in church. But that God sent Jesus to taught us to pray so that we too might have the relationship that Jesus had with his heavenly father. And so we are privileged tonight to come before God in a moment of prayer. Uh, part of it in silence and part of it offering our words and praises to God. So let us be in a moment of prayer. The joy of discovery. That moment when hope and expectation were gloriously met by the illumination of one bright star. We cannot imagine what words were spoken by visitors or if the first impressions at the manger left them somewhat confused. Messiah, Savior, a king born in the barest of palaces. Yet they saw and fell down on their knees in adoration. Lord, they saw you and knew whom they had met. And as we meet this evening, around crib and candle and advent wreath, draw us into that stable in our imagination. In the quiet moments of prayer this Christmas, that brief oasis from the bustle of the world, bring alive to us the smell of the hay, the sound of the animals, the cry of a baby. Draw us close to our Savior, Messiah, and King as we bring not gold, myrrh, or frankincense, but the gift of our lives, the only offering that we can bring. Amen. Friends, we now continue our worship by bringing before God an offering of our tithes and our gifts this Christmas Eve. Let us give generously for our good and the good of all Christ's church. Let us pray. O oh God, as we bring these gifts before you this evening, we do so on the eve Christmas, praying for the joy that will last not only for an evening, but throughout each day of our lives. And as we give you these gifts, we do so as an act of faith, 
praying that you would give us the wisdom to be your church, the church of Emmanuel, God with us, that we would use these material gifts not for our own ends, but to help shine the light of your gospel into all the corners of our community and world in need this night of your peace, your love, and your hope. And so it is, O God, that we who have gathered here now pray together, praying Jesus' prayer in the language that is most known to us and the words that are closest to our hearts, knowing that you will hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For this past month, the congregation here was invited to vote for their favorite Christmas carols. And we counted them down like American Top 40 this past Sunday. We didn't sing all 40. We sang the top 10, and we began with the 10th most, and we went from there. And the favorite song, not just of this congregation, but perhaps of all Christendom everywhere that celebrates Christmas, was the one that we are about to sing. And so this evening, we are going to invite you to light your candle. We ask that as the light comes to you, that you take the unlit candle and you hold it to the one that is already lit. We will first be hearing Night of Silence and then invite you to join in with Silent Night.
The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in deepest night are lit up with brilliant sight. Unto us a son is born, a child is given. The spread of his influence and his peace will never end. Therefore go out into the world with great joy, and the grace of Bethlehem's matchless child, the love of the God who never ceases to amaze, and the fellowship of the Spirit who never wearies will be with you this holy night and forevermore. Thanks be to God. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And a very merry and blessed Christmas. <laughs>